likely. <laughs> be on your honor. <laughs> no swearing. Okay, we're going to be talking about Azure Data Factory today and specifically about how you can build a, an ingestion framework uh, that will help build an actual solution. Uh, data Factory alone isn't a solution, it's just another tool that does data integration and data orchestration. Also, uh, I'll put a city, uh, photo of Chicago because I just moved to Chicago from Wisconsin. What? Oh, on Skype. Fun fact, I've never had, not had issues with Skype. <laughs> Is that good? Uh, yeah. Okay. Now we're going to talk about Azure Data Factory. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so a little bit about myself uh, before we get started. Uh, so, like I said, I put a picture on Chicago because I just moved to Chicago. I grew up in a town of 9,000. I know that. Um, so to help run this group, um, like I said before, I did my first talk here. Path organization is great if you haven't been a part of it. I have a lot of colleagues across the world who work with SQL Server, Azure, and anything data. Senior consultant at Avanade, so I took, so I moved to Chicago. I worked in engineering with the talent community down there. Fortune 500, global 500. Um, I helped out with the board for SQL Saturday Madison. I really like some of that volunteers at uh, times. Here, pretty much got it. I live in Chicago. I'm from a town called West Frank. Has anyone heard of West Frank, Illinois? Okay. Uh, spare time when I'm not working, and this year I'm got, I'm getting really good about like not overworking. Not really. uh, so I, I counteract that with a lot of running. I don't do lifting. I like to hike, read, travel. Most importantly, is spending time with friends, family, church, uh, old Saturdays, past communities, whatever community is important. A little bit, has anyone not heard of Avanade? Everyone's heard of Avanade? One person, two people. Uh, Avanade is uh, one of Microsoft's uh, most uh, premier partner. We've been the uh, Microsoft partner for 11 years in a row. Um, 30,000 employees. Uh, pretty much we just do Microsoft. The agenda today is, uh, I feel like I'm not in a good spot here. Yeah. Is that good? True? Okay. All right. So uh, the agenda today, uh, we're going to be talking about just a general overview of Azure Data Factory, uh, kind of look at some high-level things that will go into the ingestion framework. Uh, a high-level data ingestion strategy, what's important when doing data ingestion, what is data ingestion, what data ingestion is not. Uh, then we're going to kind of go over the Data Factory framework at a high level go down to some of the objects and start looking at the data factory pipelines and then bring it back full picture and run everything. Um, so what I hope to show you is how you can take this concept and go back to uh, your data factory work or if you're about to implement data factory, what the things you need to think about uh, when doing so and, and if it's even the right tool for your data integration and orchestration. So high level, Azure Data Factory, it's an ELT tool, data orchestration. Um, in reality, up until this point, up until Dataflow started getting released, it was really just an EL tool. 
is really just extracting data and loading it somewhere. If you did any transformation, you would have to go spin up a compute somewhere and push that data back down to whatever that compute is to actually do transformation. But just recently, and this is still in, uh, uh, it just got released to public preview, Data Factory now has uh, data flows, um, which is the transformation piece. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it an ETL tool. It really makes it an EL ETL tool. So extract it, you load it somewhere, 90% of the time it's a data lake. And then uh, once you do your data science on it, you find value in that data, then you're going to go and do that additional ETL uh, your data warehouse, Azure Data Warehouse, or so forth. Um, so if you ever seen like people like throwing all these like mixing all the letters around, like that's where that comes from. Um, so use cases, data ingestion. When I talk about data ingestion, I'm specifically talking about loading data into a data lake. I'm not talking about loading it into a relational database and someone calling it relational database a data lake. The concept is there, uh, sometimes it fits, but um, there's a lot of different practices that you need to account for when you're loading data into an HDFS system versus a relational database. Other use cases besides just ingesting data, machine learning pipelines, uh, streaming pipelines, uh, then the ETL piece now that you have data flows. Um, all data flows is, is uh, uh, under the hood is Azure Databricks, if anyone's heard of that. Uh, it's just pushing that data down there and uh, doing those compute there. So I haven't spent a lot of time on data flows. We're not going to go over it. But I feel like a year from now, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at a lot of people's Databricks implementation or data factory implementation. It's going to be this huge mess of all these different diagrams everywhere. Uh, it's going to turn back into that uh, some of those SSIS packages that got out of hand. Um, so it's very important to understand like the the layers of moving data from one area to the next area and then doing the actual work in one place versus trying to do all these different transformations within one pipeline. Um, data factory. Who's worked with data factory? Just curious. So are you guys working with in, in production or uh, you guys looking to, anyone looking to spin it up? Uh, currently. So Data Factory is, uh, you have four primary entities within Data Factory. In the, uh, behind the scenes, everything is just JSON code. And at a high level, everything is encapsulated by a pipeline. And that pipeline includes activities that can run, activities such as like copy activities, loops, so forth. Just think of those uh, activities that you would have in SSIS. Um, then, very important, the data set uh, is what gets consumed and produced uh, within an activity. And then a data set is represented from a linked service, and all linked services is a connection. Um, we're going to swing back around to this here in a little while, and it'll bring things around full circle. A um, little bit uh, a high level ELT, really quick. Within Azure, if you haven't heard of this, Storage and compute is separated, and that's where ELT comes from. We got to move data to one store that is specific to our use case. Maybe a certain store uh, runs analytics better, such as Azure Data Lake Store, um, and then maybe we want to make it a SQL Data Warehouse. And so this is where it becomes more of an orchestration of the data versus a specific uh, uh, integration. A little example here of an ETL pipeline. Uh, essentially, you have you have a package uh, to load uh, source table or table one, and you have another package. There's supposed to be table two there, but that's also so. I guess it's a duplicate word. I put this together for like three days. I've been up. To the, um, ELT pipeline is a little different. It's uh, you you create the frame and then you pass in metadata, and it basically can do things in parallel. Um, and it's a lot less development in the actual pipeline. So the work that I'm doing right now for a client, we have a very, very simple pipeline that can ingest data from any relational database within, within their enterprise. And the goal is we hardly ever have to go do development within Azure Data Factory. All of our development, or most of our configuration, more or less, is done within the metadata underneath.
this is kind of a bonus slide I threw in here, um, just because of how well the functionality of CI/CD uh, and Git is built into Data Factor. I just wanted to quickly throw this in here. Um, I don't even know if I did cover too much of this. I think I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna hang on. If we have time at the end, I'm gonna swing back around to this, and I'll actually show you how you can work with CI/CD and uh, within Data Factor. Like I told you guys, this is my this is my trial talk for SQL Saturday conferences. It's my first time doing this presentation. All right, so let's go ahead and do a demo. Take a seat here. We're going to look at Azure Data Factor. So if you want to spin up Azure Data Factory, even if you aren't using Azure at your uh, at your company, um, you can. I think you, I think they still have a, a thing where you can sign up and get like hundred dollars free credits of Azure if you haven't already done so. Um, so if you want to spin up Azure Data Factory, we just go into create a resource. Can't see it, can you? It's not duplicating on my screen. It took me five minutes to get it like this, so I'm not not going to change it. All right. First time I've had to do this. Okay, so I'm in Azure right now. Um, so if you want to spin up Azure Data Factory, uh, we can just go in here, create a resource. Uh, type in Azure Data Factory. And I'm not actually going to spin it up. I just want to show you how easy it is to spin this up. We go to create. And then we just have a few things. Give it a name. Choose the subscription that you're on. Uh, create a resource group or uh, an existing resource group. And all a resource group is is a collection of uh, different resources within Azure. Uh, the version. So right now, if you want to go check out data uh, data flows, you have to spin up a, a separate uh, data factory because they're not supporting uh, data flows uh, in their prod. Uh, uh, and then V1. Is anyone still using V1? Out of curiosity. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> V1 was uh, if you if you haven't played around, V1 was basically just the JSON code. So they had to handwrite all this JSON code, and it was horrible. Um, so now we have a, a nice UI where we can just drag and drop and auto write a lot of that code. All right, so that's how you spin up Data Factory. Um, I'm going to go down here to my tile. This is the current Data Factory I have. Actually, I already have it open. Okay. So this is the main UI. This actually just came out probably six months ago. Uh, it was a big hit with the community. Uh, give you a little lay of the land here. Um, when you open up Data Factory, this is your main screen. You can, I've actually haven't done this thing, but this is like a really quick, if you just need to quickly copy data into Azure, uh, you can just, it walks you through the process, very simple, um, but don't do that. You're better than that. Um, <laughs> You go to the edit tab here, and then you can actually start building pipelines. Um, so over here on the left here, I have uh, areas for the pipelines. I can even I can categorize my pipelines into folders. Um, I have data sets. Uh, those are also categorized. I have my linked services here in my connections. And our connection list is huge. I mean, it's much bigger than SSIS. Uh, and there, I, I saw just, I think just yesterday they added another four or five, uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, another thing which is very important to this framework was uh, a few weeks ago they released dynamic linked services. So now uh, the goal when I'm developing Data Factory is I, I just want to create one linked service, make it completely dynamic, then my metadata factory will 
uh, fuel that link service based on, I'm getting ahead of the presentation here, based on a data set, I would tie that to tell it to what type of connection it has. So if it's SQL Server data, I would tell it to tie to that data set. And um, so when it's spinning up these different parallel instances in Azure Data Factory, based on which data set it is, uh, it'll have its associated link service information with it. Um, if you're pulling from on-prem data, you need to spin up an integration runtime. Um, that it's essentially it's kind of like the Power BI gateway. If you if you use Power BI, um, it's pretty easy to do. You can do it through the portal now. Uh, it, it walks you through everything. Super simple. Um, yeah. It's worth knowing that on prem side is using the term loop. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Um, we can connect to our integration runtimes over here on the right. Uh, one important thing about integration runtime runtimes is uh, once you start spinning up Data Factory and you start pulling in a lot of data from your on-prem uh, environment, you're gonna the data amount is gonna increase unless you you have the capital to buy Azure Express. Um, you need scalability. Um, so integration runtime, you can scale it out to, I believe, four uh, additional nodes. Um, so I think I'll, I'll hit on a little bit more of that uh, here in a little while. Um, so we've covered, covered connections. Let me just open up one of these real quick. So I have a, a data lake storage connection here. Um, when I talk about like making these dynamic, if I click on, I clicked on the wrong one. So I got a SQL, Azure SQL uh, instance here. I can choose this dynamic here and I can, uh, I'm getting way ahead of here. <laughs> I can add in parameter, uh, Azure Data Factory parameters. So if it was like link service, sorry, not typing this right. I think it would be like link service and then, all right, Azure Data Factory is being too slow. It's gonna slow me down. Um, We'll swing back around to parameters too. That's a very important piece. Right now we're just doing an overview of data factor. Data factor. Uh, so what else do we have? So all right. So I have a, a pretty simple uh, pipeline here. It's I have a. A test database on a, a SQL server on my laptop, AdventureWorks, and I, I basically just want to copy all the tables and throw them into Data Lake. Um, so I, I just want to show you how easy it is to do it with a simple pipeline. We have two activities here. Oh, that's one other thing I wanted to show you. So our activities list, so uh, custom batch processes, uh, Azure Databricks notebooks we can run, we can add uh, pin custom libraries to those. Um, Ruben transform. So this is the copy uh, data activity. Uh, it takes a source data set and a sync data set. Uh, mapping, but you don't have to do mapping. So everything that I've done, I've avoided mapping nearly as much as possible because all I'm doing is ingesting data. I just want to get data into data lake as fast as possible um, with the least amount of overhead as far as development. So back to this pipeline, it's doing two things. It's uh, essentially just doing a lookup of uh, information schema, uh, grabbing a, a list of tables from AdventureWorks, uh, and then it's gonna throw that into a for each loop, which is gonna spin up uh, parallel instances to copy that data. So if I look at this, loo uh, this lookup here, got a simple query, it's connecting to uh, uh, an Azure SQL database, and I'm just grabbing a uh, table schema and table name. 
uh, data factory likes uh, everything uh, with uh, brackets around it. So uh, whenever I'm storing metadata, I'll be sure to always uh, store a, a field of like the schema and table with those with those brackets. So I have a list now from that lookup, and in my for each, let me see if I can zoom in. Yeah. So in my for each, I can access that list by going into this items, type it in that activity, which is called get tables. And then if I do output.value, I'll then be able to access the fields within that, my sub activities of my for each loop. So now if I go into that loop, I can add additional activities. And you can't do additional loops within this loop. I don't know if it's on the roadmap, um, but it's kind of a nice guideline to keep your data factory simple. So I'm pulling in that list, and then I have, this is essentially how you can do dynamic SQL within um, Azure Data Factory. Oh, shoot. I was trying to zoom, but it, it just tabbed over. Um, but essentially what we got there is uh, select everything from, and then uh, if you want to write an expression anywhere within Azure Data Factory, you can start with uh, an at symbol. Um, and then what I'm pulling in there is my item. So that's the item that I'm with, uh, within, which was my for each loop. Then I'm referencing that column that I pulled in from uh, my lookup, which was my table name. Not outside the X. Uh, there's there's uh, there's one page that covers expressions for Azure Data Factory. It is really confusing at first, um, but just look at this. The two things here, all that's doing is uh, converting or casting it to a string. Um, but I think the most important thing is to know is that if, if you want to create an expression, you, you just you start it with an, the at symbol. Um, and then kind of just go from there. Uh, there's some internal code such as like like that item functionality. I you know I did see I came across this one page which was for some other technology in Azure which uses a similar language, um, and I haven't been able to find it. So I'm going to say yes, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> I, I think in my experience, some of the challenges have been, um, so one, if you do just a general search for keywords or something, you have to pay close attention to the URL because the V1 and the V2 yeah. libraries look similar. So sometimes the syntax will be V1 and not V2. So you need to make sure it aligns with the version you're in. And the other thing is, in here, it seems like it's almost always the expression language and that seems straightforward. But when you're passing parameters and doing, you know, the various other places that you might use Doesn't variables, them. it switches between kind of like functions and expressions, and it, it, it seems like it gets weird, especially working with dates and things. In my experience, it seemed that way. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, just that, to add on to that, if you're if you're like adding in uh, expressions or if, uh, or parameters into a data set, um, it'll sometimes like say it's incorrect, but it's correct. That's just data factory being um, young and it's and it's prime still. All right. There we go. Um, so uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand what you said. So. Because uh, a common uh, thing that people want to do is, let's say I'm passing in an input, uh, like let's say even the pipeline run ID, the ID of this current run, mm -hmm. and now when I'm writing it out, I want to include that as part of my output. Can I actually have that be one of the columns of the output? Yes. Um, 
we're doing that here. Uh, I believe some of the stuff I, I've uh, done. Uh, bring it back up, but um, I just wasn't sure if that's what you said. But yeah, that, it's, it's essentially what we're doing here because you can add parameters to the data set. You can add parameters to a link service, um, and essentially, when you're doing everything dynamic, like yeah, if you want to. So, what was your use case again? Like adding an additional column? Right. Or? So if uh, I'm uh, taking data out of the data lake and now I'm going to say land it in a data warehouse for an ETL process, um, I might want to include the uh, like pipeline run ID of the current job so I know what staged it. And uh, it seems like you can't directly uh, include that parameter that's being passed into that uh, activity uh, as part of the output definition. Um, um, so, okay, so I think the, the, when I've done it, I've done it specifically with linked services. So if you if your linked service is dynamic, you'll get a couple of fields that pop up where you can pass in those, like, for okay. instance, like uh, if I'm passing a database name, I could pass it in that way. Yeah, I, I, I could follow up offline, you know, after this then, and I'd be interested in understanding that better. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we'll actually walk through it, so uh, good question. Um, so uh, here, basically, uh, th what this copy activity is uh, we, we've created an expression that's going to pass in a, a table name that we've gathered from a list of tables from AdventureWorks database. Uh, it's going to take that and it's going to copy it uh, into Azure Data Lake Store. So if I go over to back to my portal real quick, I'm going to jump over to my data lake. Just jump into the Data Explorer, and I have a folder here called Data Lake, and I I don't have any any data in here right now. So if I go over to back over to my I keep looking at my screen, I'm thinking it's working right. It's not. Um, if I go over back to my portal here. Um, let, me, let me just show you these other fields real quick. So uh, our sync data. So this is kind of what I was talking about. So. Um, Ignore I said that. I'm not sure why that's there. Uh, we're not doing any mapping, so essentially we're just we're identifying our source data, which is just select everything from all of our tables, and we're going to land it into a data lake. So if I go ahead and run that real quick, probably it'll take about 15 seconds, and I can just monitor my data factories, and it'll show all the activities that are spinning up. Here, so you can tell that it's, it's spun up a act, copy table activity uh, for every table within that list. So it's got the tables. You got to hit refresh every few seconds, and it succeeded. So I just copied 17 or so tables to my data lake, um, pretty seamlessly. Uh, if you want to, so if something errors out here, um, you can usually uh, it usually gives you an error either. Uh, through the output uh, button, uh, which gives you some important information, as well as uh, this little guy here. It can give you some additional information. So, my target data set that's representing my landing zone in my data lake. target path, I'm also referencing that table name. Um, so if I have a list, so, so as far as like data lake organization goes, it's usually, especially with relational databases, uh, I usually do something along the lines of server, databases, tables, and then you start getting into like what that partitioning strategy looks like, uh, whether it's breaking data up by year, uh, and then within that year having multiple files for like Every, uh, either like a file a day, or maybe we want to get more granular and we have files every minute. Like it's always a, a different use case based on like which data set we're pulling in. Um, so if I go back over to my store. So you see my uh, my data lake there, and I have a uh, everything written out here by the schema and table name. 
Um, and I can go in it and actually have, there's not really any data in that table. But all it is is a flat file and you consume it with whatever tool you're using. So with big data, the, what, the reason we can do this uh, is because a lot of the tools you can query directories instead of just files. So Spark, uSQL, Hive, you can query a directory such as, I could just query this table, this table directory. So my input path would just be my data lake and then my table. And then I can query the data, the data underneath it. Uh, I could do where predicates to uh, say I only want to look at data from my 2018 physical partition, um, and it alleviates a lot of overhead as far as performance goes. When we start talking about partitioning, it's probably the most important thing when it comes to data lake. Um, you have two aspects, aspects of that. You have physical partitioning of the files, and then uh, the partitioning of the tables whenever you decide to consume that. So if you're so a lot of things that I'm looking at right now uh, with some clients are is Databricks Delta, and we're looking to see how that can uh, benefit uh, some of the solutions we're implementing. Um, and, and something I'm very excited about with Databricks Delta is it has automated partitioning. So traditionally, like with uSQL, you had to manually like partition all uh, all of your tables that you decided. Great. And a lot of the best practices with eSQL was don't even create a table unless you need it for extra performance. Um, so uh, it, it really comes down to the use case and the individual uh, um, environment that you're working within. Uh, but you got to be sure to keep those two things in mind. Uh, we'll go over partitioning a little bit more here in a minute. I don't think I have anything else to show in that first little demo. The most important thing is to uh, understand that you can uh, build simple pipelines with this and accomplish uh, a lot of data movement here. Let me get back to a presentation. So, okay, we're gonna go ahead and start talking about data ingestion. I'm going to have to start picking it up here. Um, a lot of the conversations I've had about data lake and why are we, why are we pulling all this data into a data lake? Um, and that conversation starts to drive towards, like, why, why don't we just start, go ahead and land it into a data, data warehouse? Um, the reality of a lot of, uh, just based on my experience of a lot of the projects I've been working on the last couple of years, is the projects that I've been working on is, there, these companies are wanting to implement and get data science up and running. And the projects that they're doing, the data science project is bringing so much value to the company that it doesn't necessarily make sense to, it's gonna take us longer to move that data to a data warehouse and then uh, allow them to explore that data. Um, but another thing is we're not just talking about relational data here. The current project I'm on, I have 75 different uh, file types that is considered big data. There's video. Uh, the team of data science, uh, they're doing, I don't even know what they're doing to me. It's, it's above my head. They're doing uh, material science stuff and they're augmenting that space. It's amazing. Um, so what we're really doing here is enabling data scientists. We're not building data warehouses. Once we get that value from those data science pipelines, then we'll go and operationalize those and we'll move that the, the results into our data warehouses. Um, so that's been, uh, usually that's been what the, the use case has been. Um, I just wanted to show here uh, just how, you know, as we start doing that more predictive and prescriptive analytics, uh, the higher that value comes for, for a business. I'm a huge advocate of data warehousing, but uh, it becomes different when we start doing data science work on unrelational data. So if you look at a quick over uh, high level strategy and uh, if you really have a strategy conversation with me, I, I won't really say this is a strategy, this is more of a, a five requirements uh, for when building your uh, data ingestion project. Uh, or really the five most important things that, that I took into account when building this framework. 
how to handle delta changes because it's a lot different. It's an insert-only architecture. We're not going to go in and delete data when we're ingesting data into a data lake. Um, partitioning, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with delta changes. Uh, I went over a little bit about partitioning acquisitions. Uh, I want to be able to quickly acquire. If I just had some department that has a new SQL server, I want to build to ingest that data uh, simply. And with the framework that I've, that I've built, I, you don't even have to do additional uh, configuration. It will automatically pick that up. All, all, the only thing you have to do is add the server name. So we'll find that SQL server or whatever uh, database that might be. Uh, configurable, so these data sets need to be configurable. We need to be able to disable them. Uh, we need to be able to enable partitioning on some of them. We're not going to partition every single table out there. Um, if a table has 20 records in it, just copy over it every time. Um, discovery, uh, capture insights about what data we're pulling into the data lake. Uh, and we can do a lot of uh, cool things with that information. We can automate, uh, so for instance, it's best practice to store your data, I like to I like to say between 500 megs and 2 gigs in file chunks in your data lake in order to get the best performance within uh, within your big data uh, tooling. Um, it's got either, either once it's crossed a certain threshold as far as how big the data is or, or something along those lines, then automatically you switch that over to start partitioning. Um, based on, um, usually that's going to require manual input, but uh, there's some default settings you can you can do uh, to automatically partition that. Uh, so that physical partitioning piece. So I have two copy types here on the left. Uh, that's just a storage uh, process for delta changes. Uh, it's one way to do it, and then uh, your storage process for full. So. A full is just a small data set, just copy them over every time. You don't even have to worry about doing uh, handling uh, delta changes. Um, one other thing I want to point out real quick. A lot of times when we're doing this stuff, the other departments, because usually these data science projects are one-off. They're not always inclusive of every team. Sometimes there's, multiple, there's tons of teams in very large organizations. Um, so uh, a lot of, some of the times the requirements have been like, we don't want to throw overhead onto this department. So we need to build all of this without modifying the source databases, um, without implementing change tracking on all these source databases. Ideally, that would be best case scenario. If I could, if, if I could do it the way I wanted to, I'd implement change tracking on all the source databases and use that to handle delta changes. Um, but that's never been the case for me. <laughs> um, so. Uh, that, that becomes uh, very difficult when you start having to manage files um, and not just tables. But uh, so delta changes, uh, we're storing things by server name, uh, databases, tables. Uh, you could throw in schema at the additional folder if, it, if you think it would help you. Uh, then just for this uh, specific example of this table, we chunked up by year. Uh, and then the individual file is getting recorded, uh, getting the date time as the file name that it was just if it's full, it gets a, a current uh, partition folder name as well as a current file name. Uh, Insert-only architecture. Is, is there anyone not who's not familiar with like insert-only architecture? Like in, like insert-only. Like uh, who's not familiar with Apache Hive or USQL or so with those types of technologies. Uh, USQL, for instance, we couldn't we couldn't delete from a table. A delete statement didn't even exist. You, you essentially have to append changes, and then you have to read those changes. Um, so it, it, it's it's a very different way of thinking. You don't just say I delete this record uh, if it doesn't exist in my uh, source database. So uh, a lot of things you got to take into account. Uh, big data best practice. Uh, there's a, a problem with big, some of the big data tool, or a lot of the big data tooling. Uh, you have to avoid many small files. So if you are ingesting event data and you have millions of records, or if not billions of records, it becomes very um, uh, CPU intensive uh, to process all that data. So that's where that best practice of 
between 500 megs and two gigabyte chunks comes into play. And you can, ideally you're gonna partition that on ingestion, but you could do some sort of cooking process after the fact that it's been ingested. So Sean, even on that, if you, if you don't have the luxury of having like a change data capture capability in a source database mm -hmm. or source system, do you have a go-to technique for how you would normally try to, to implement um, kind of um, a, a change? Would you just always be ingesting the entire source and, and just pushing it all in, or would you go back like X number of days, or do you have any kind of typical strategy that you follow? Or? Yeah, so it's, uh, if you ha have you done a little bit of data factory work? So are you aware of the, the Watermark blog that uh, Microsoft put out so essentially if you if you if you have a source table um, and you have a verified column usually a date time column you can use that uh, uh, and capture that data in a metadata table or, or in a full-blown case a framework like we're eventually going to get to and um, eventually uh, so the next time it runs it's just going to grab all the data that's changed after that not only, you don't always have the luxury of a modified uh, timestamp. Um, I'm waiting uh, probably next week. I'm about to go to prod and we're gonna figure out which <laughs> some of those columns are. Um, but I mean, there's other ways. Uh, no, I, I, it's not quite, I just to get. Yeah, it, it follows the, the watermark uh, method. Um, I have a little uh, additional things that, I, that I've done. Let's see if we can very long and get to them. Uh, one, one very important thing here, and this is true in the data warehousing world too, is you need to know how you're going to consume the data. Um, and this isn't necessarily, this isn't from a, still from an end user perspective, but it's from a data science perspective. What are, what are the tools that they're going to use? Where are they going to consume it, et cetera? Uh, data ingestion. Why is it three stars? Um, oh, this is the acquisition piece. So don't build a new pipeline for every package. I've I've seen uh, a company build a pipeline for every table, every relational table to ingest data into a data lake. This is the absolute wrong way to do data factory. Um, the reason that says exception is addition of a new source type that's specific to the framework. Um, That shouldn't be in there yet. Um, configurable, so we can disable ingestion. Uh, we can enable partitioning. We can create custom ADF parameters specific to a data set uh, and pull that in when uh, the data framework kicks off. Um, discoverable, so capture insights into individual partition loads, capture insights into uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just trying to make up some time here. All right, so finally, let's get into the, uh, some of the, the framework pieces here. I didn't think I would take that long to go over all that previous stuff, but that's why I'm experimenting the first go around. Um, building framework, framework requirements. Uh, we're enabling a data science team. Uh, we're creating a data pipeline, a single pipeline to ingest data sets for multiple source types across the enterprise. Uh, so the one we're looking at will only be pulling in SQL Server data, but I'll show you how easy you can add on new source files. Configurable, uh, cost-effective, that gets down to architecture. With Azure, anything Azure, like architecture becomes so much more important because you see the exact dollar amount of how much resource versus a six-figure license of just SQL Server. And, you know, maybe maybe you can cut off a license here and there. But yeah, it becomes uh, that much more important. Um, the pipeline should be schemaless, so no table mapping. Uh, what else here? This is just noise. So let's, everyone knows what a framework is. We're gonna pass it. Um, so uh, back to this. Ah, okay, that's why I put it in there. But <laughs> this definition of what a framework is, it's a structure around uh, if something is built. So if we look back at this Azure Data Factory diagram, um, pretty much everything revolves around a data set. That's what we're ingesting. A data set can be a table, 
It can be a piece of a table. It can be a file. So that's what I decided to build my framework around. And then I started thinking about Data Vault. Uh, Data Vault was designed for massive uh, EDWs. It was developed out of the Defense Department by Dan Lindstadt. Um, Azure is changing constantly, so I need to be able to add on uh, additional pieces to this framework if new functionality comes out, such as Azure Data Flows. Uh, that'll be the next thing that I'll be adding on to it. I'm already looking into it. Uh, what else here? Uh, and we can do that by adding new attributes, which are called satellites. Uh, to our entities, which are call, called hubs within uh, uh, Data Vault. Uh, disclaimer, this is a Data Vault-ish implementation. So Tom, Tom's a Data Vault expert in the room. Um, probably critique the heck out of it. Uh, real quick example of a Data Vault. So like I said, our, our blue uh, tables here are our hubs, which are our entities. And then we have uh, yellow satellites, which uh, describe that entity, and we can connect hubs and uh, satellites through links, which uh, represent like a transaction. High level conceptual architecture here, we're doing two things. We have two pipelines. I think I misspoke and said I had one pipeline earlier. I have two pipelines. One pipeline is going to go and ingest information schema from relational databases. Uh, it's going to capture all that metadata. And that's where a list of servers comes into play. So I pass in a list of servers to the schema loader. And then uh, finally, the, the next pipeline that runs is the data loader. It's going to look at all that metadata and it's going to go get the data. Um, if I wanted to add on um, additional functionality to the schema loaders, say I wanted to grab on uh, metadata about files, um, well, I can still do that within Data Factory. You have the luxury of data, uh, Databricks notebooks. You have Spark. Spark is awesome if you haven't looked at it. It has way more functionality than T-SQL as far as data analysis goes. Um, you have, uh, because you have uh, Spark and you have Python, Python libraries are just like awesome. <laughs> That's all I can say about Python. Python's great. Um, so that's what we're doing. So we start getting into the framework a little bit here. Um, we think about defining what our hubs and our links are. So uh, we have two hubs, and these are the three most important tables here. Can you, can you guys see that in the back? A little bit? No. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have to, I can't zoom. It won't let me zoom. Um, the top table there, uh, I called that my data set definition table. That's going to define a data set. From there, I'll be able to add on satellites which describe that data set. At the bottom, I have a linked service definition. I'm only going to add in one record per specific linked service. Um, you can have multiple, you might have multiple SQL Server uh, linked services in there if those linked services need to be configured differently. Uh, say, for instance, for whatever reason, so we, uh, I use Key Vault a lot for all my secret uh, passwords. Uh, let's just say uh, this is a wild example. I, I can't use secrets for one SQL server for whatever reason, and I can the other. Well, then I would just create two uh, separate connections in my linked service uh, table. The, the table in the, the middle is the ADF definition table. That's tying a data set to a linked service, and that relationship is many data sets, of course, to one connection. Satellites here, uh, these are going to be our tables that describe our entity. Um, at the bottom, I've added on linked service configuration, which is a, which is a key value table, and a, on the left is just a type table. The type is just going to be a distinct list of uh, linked services within Azure Data Factory. The configuration table, because it's a key value, I needed something um, uh, to support dynamic development and um, each linked service has a different varying number of parameters, uh, configurable uh, 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 input, I would say. Uh, moving over to our data sets. Uh, in the middle there is our data set definition table. And this is in all the tables. Uh, I kept it simple. There's a ton more tables that I have uh, in production scenarios. I wanted to list the most important ones so you can build off of it. So I have uh, data set options, data set tables, data set copy types, and then the bottom is just uh, that link table, the ADF definition. 
uh, whenever I'm loading this, the primary key is essentially that data set definition. So that's going to be the first table I load. The data set tables, it's going to be what my, that's going to be a lot of my information schema from my SQL server. That's going to be my server name, my, my table catalog, uh, my uh, table type. So within an information schema, you have views and tables. And the data set option, you're going to have one record there for every data set uh, definition. And you're, you essentially, that's where you have the configurable stuff. Is enabled, is partition enabled. Um, is, what's the other one? I can't think of the other one I have. Uh, is ingestion enabled, is configuration enabled, and is partition enabled? Um, so I have that luxury of uh, turning particular data sets on and off, uh, or whole databases, or servers, and so forth. Uh, the copy type is just a list of different copy types. So I have two in this demonstration, a, a full copy and a delta copy. Uh, source type. So this is just, so every source type. And when I say source type, that would be that would mimic a uh, linked service in Data Factory. So here it's just SQL uh, on prem SQL. I just kept the naming convention the same. I'm going to have a staging table, a landing table, and a merge procedure for for each source type. Uh, everything here is pretty uh, self-explanatory. I have SQL uh, as an abbreviation between everything because there's a lot of a uh, uh, name type conflicts you'll run into with data factory, such as like table name. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just using the, the the source type for that abbreviation. The the other thing that's important here is I'm generating generating hashes on the as I land data into the staging table. I'm generating a hash for a unique row. I'm generating a hash for um, because I'm pulling in columns in this specific example here. Um, I have a, a hash hash key for a specific row, a hash table for a specific table, and a hash column to identify a column. And I'm going to need that when I load uh, those tables, my data set tables table and my data set columns table. Uh, so loading the model. Uh, here I have an example. So if I were to have, uh, if I had on, added on MySQL, that information schema is going to be slightly different than SQL Server. Um, so that's going to get its own set of tables and its own uh, stored procedure. And then there's going to be another procedure. And this is probably the most complicated uh, SQL piece in here. Uh, it's going to take the data from those tables, and, it, and then you're going to go and load those, uh, the data, data set definition, options, uh, tables and any other uh, tables that you decide to add, uh, such as columns. I'm trying to think of some other ones. I have, I have tables set up right now for like uh, the partition types. So with Dataflow, uh, if you don't know this, um, it has built-in partitioning methods. And so we'll actually be able to utilize some uh, standard partitioning, so it's like hash partitioning and, uh, and so forth. Um, so I haven't figured out how that's going to work yet. Try not to overcomplicate it, but we'll see. Uh, so high level, we have sources, different source types. We have uh, uh, the data loader pipeline, and that's going to read a view or source procedure from the metadata uh, model, and then it's going to load our target, which is data lake store. Uh, that master view, not actually a view. You can change that. It's just a stored procedure. Um, the granularity is either going to be it's going to be down to the table, uh, the partition of a table. So if we're if we need to uh, like our very first load, uh, I don't want the very first file to be 100 gigs and all my files after that be like a megabyte. Um, so what I what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify that column. So my source order date column, for example, let's say I have 100 million records. It's, and I've identified that each year of that is uh, two gigs. Those numbers probably don't add up at all. Um, so I have, a, I now have not only a list of tables, but I have a list of partitions of that table. So that's what's going to get passed into Data Factory, not the not the table itself. Does that make sense? So earlier when you saw, started copying in 15 tables at once. 
Well, now it's going to start copying individual partitions, and it's going to load those individual partitions into the data lake. Now I'm going to have an even, uh, even set of data across my data lake, which is going to be a huge impact on performance. So big data tools, you don't just throw stuff in data lake, spin up Hive, and automatically performance is awesome. So there's a, there's a lot of things that go into it uh, to actually get that performance out of that technology. All right, let's uh, do the final demo here, and we'll walk through. Um, we'll kind of walk through the data flow, and, and then back to the factory. All right, so uh, we're going to walk through the data flow kind of as it flows through the tables. Uh, so the very first thing is connect to your database. Ah, dang it. Hang on. Ah, my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Lower than usual. Hmm. Questions while this. Stored procedures. So, if you had MySQL or SQL Server, each of those sources is kind of aggregating its own metadata, and then you're bringing that together in the Azure Data Factory. You're asking, well, you're asking each source to supply its own metadata. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, when I go to uh, connected, when I go to the pipe, setting SQL um, because that SQL code is not going to change most of the time, nine times out of ten. Unless you have like SQL Server 2003, I don't even know if they had SQL Server that year. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you're going to embed like a, an information schema query uh, based on that source. So uh, top here, super simple. It's literally just a list of server names, um, and that's getting passed into uh, the schema loader. Uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with information schema, you can get any uh, all the information about your objects within a, a database. Um, so here I just have uh, my catalog names, schema, table, columns, the position of those columns, how big those columns are, data types, etc. You can get all that data from the, the, the columns. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything that's really relevant towards what we're doing here that's going to uh, live in any other table. So the first thing that's going to happen, it's going to go and retrieve that data based off of whatever connection uh, that data set is associated with. Uh, it's going to get the information schema, so let's just go ahead and run it. So i got this load schema pipeline. Uh, it's getting that list of servers. We're going to do the same thing that we did in the, the, the simple pipeline. I'm truncating my stage, and then I have a for each for each uh, server, and then in here I would have. Um, I think there's a couple ways you could do it, um, and I I've asked for some additional functionality, but pretty much here you might have probably uh, a different copy. Uh, data activity for each source type, and then you just have a filter or, or, or some sort of filter. It's a, if it's SQL type, do this. If it's MySQL, do this. It doesn't really matter. You still have like two activities to ingest all of your MySQL and all of your SQL Server and all of your files. Um, so it's pretty much it's super simple. 
I like simple. So it's going to take that data. It's going to uh, we're passing in here. Uh, this is where we're passing in the server name to that linked service. So I have an on-prem uh, SQL Server connection, and I'm passing in a server name uh, to that back to that connection. Uh, the database I'm just leaving is master, uh, and then my my query is just this really. Oh, it is. This is the only time I've ever used this, but it's using a SPMS for HDB. Um, and I, I, there's everything on the internet that pretty much say don't use it, but this is the one time I found that it worked. And I actually found one way it didn't work. It didn't work if I ran it on like MSDB. Like it only gave me certain uh, data back, so I had to configure, I had to point everything to master database. That might have just been the specific database that I, that I was on, but I don't know, it was weird. Uh, and then, so that's just going to run this uh, information query uh, for each database on that server. And that's how I'm getting all my metadata from, um, from a SQL server. Uh, the next thing, it's just, uh, so that landed it into a staging table. This is just going to execute the procedure, which I'm not going to walk through. It's just a merge uh, procedure. Uh, and it's going to load it to uh, its target SQL table. Go ahead and run that real quick. So just take a moment. Any questions about this piece? Or thoughts? Have you guys done this previously with SSIS? Was it a lot more work? I know it is because I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact that you don't have to specify this key. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. The, the fact that you don't have to outline explicitly, you can, but you don't have to uh, put in the scheme, I think that that's good. But I do think the learning curve of getting the right syntax of the parameters or functions mm -hmm. and expressions, um, that does take some time. Yeah. Same here. It took me, took me a while to, to get it to. And then I thought I got it right, and then, it, then I was wrong. And then <laughs> okay, so it's finished. Um, I go back to my model real quick. I see that I now have dated my staging table and my SQL table. Now I can load it to the model, which I've already done. We're running out of time. Um, so here I just have a, a list of, and, and the procedure that loads this is a little tricky. Um, you have to, you know, you have to do it appropriately. Like if you insert I'm identifying, I'm loading everything to like a temp table and then I'm, I'm processing that one one record at a time. Um, I want to make sure it goes in everywhere and if it fails, I want to be sure to roll that back because then I, I have all these additional records in my dataset definition table and then I have no records in my dataset table table. Um, so uh, be sure to spend time on the procedure that loads that model. Um, that's uh, the, that's uh, the most important object of the model. <laughs> Is the one that loads it. So that's the that was the primary uh, the hub, primary entity of a data set uh, that everything uh, is described off of. So uh, the second table options we just have different and I'm defaulting everything to be ingested uh, mo most of the time. That's going to be the case. Um, but if something breaks, I can quickly come in here and disable it. Uh, the configuration piece has been irrelevant to this date. Uh, Basically, I haven't had to add a lot of uh, configuration to a specific data set, but if I wanted to, I also have another config, uh, a key value table that I can tie specific parameters to a data set. Uh, and then this is just uh, tying the, the actual table data to definition, uh, columns. I'm not going to show you all of that. Everyone has seen a column. And then just the last example here. So uh, I have this table. I think it's, it's the, what table is this? I think it's the order 
fact order table of AdventureWorks. I have a procedure here that's just gonna configure partitioning. Uh, so I'm passing in uh, uh, basically with the column name, I could probably get rid of this guy. Uh, but what it's gonna do, it's gonna make sure that the column exists um, before, before configuring everything. Um, and this is gonna throw in um, uh, how we want to chunk up that data. And I'm, I'm saying I wanna chunk it up by year. Uh, so the code in the, in the store procedure that's configuring it, we're not walking through. I'd be happy to, to share it with you if you get to that point and you have questions to uh, wanna know how to do that, I'd be happy to share it. Um, so, so just run that real quick. And I see I now have a record uh, in my, I'm not sure what table this is, getting late. <laughs> um, but I'm telling it which column of that table uh, to partition and the expression that goes along with it. So I see that um, this is all my information about this data set, partitions enabled, Ingestions enabled. Then I have this data set watermark table. I don't like that name. I'm gonna change the name. It's not really a watermark. Um, but it's just capturing uh, column names, values. I'm capturing that, uh, the watermark on this table for that particular data set. Um, and then whether or not it's been processed and then this is probably the second most complicated SQL piece of this whole thing is the procedure that actually views this in an appropriate way. So this is where I'm, this is where all the code is to say, has this data been loaded? If not, uh, I want the configurations appropriately to, uh, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a lot here, um, hang on one second. Yeah, this, this sort of procedure does a lot, um, but it basically it needs to know if it's, if it's a full copy type, well, I only want one record per table or data set. If it's a delta copy type, I want to be sure to, you know, do different join, joins differently so I get those watermark, or this is why the, the language is kind of confusing still, get those partitions so I have one record for every partition. This should have data in it. Maybe I broke something. Hmm. I was playing with this before I got here, which I shouldn't have done. I think I broke this guy. Yeah, so uh, I did break something probably. Um, I was trying to add something new. I shouldn't have done that. But uh, the second piece is going to be the, the pipeline load data. So this is going to get that procedure. It's going to get a list of distinct data sets. So partitions, if it's delta, full copies, if it's the full, or uh, data, just the table name, if it's full copy, uh, and so forth. And then all the associated configuration values with that data set. Uh, database and run a query to get a distinct list of that column that we set up that expression with, to get a distinct list of a uh, year in this example, and then store that data. The first time I built this, I built it to check, kind of do checks every single time, and 90, like, the majority of the data that we were ingesting, nothing was changing. Um, and, and, and also I didn't need to read whether or not uh, I needed to run, what was it? Whether or not I needed to get a list, I was doing that on the source. So I was creating all these different connections and, and your cost is immediately going up. Um, so I wanted to add the functionality to only go and run that query if I, if I actually need to. So 
I have that list now of the tables that need that partition list gathered, and then there, the for each loop is going to go uh, to the source database that it's associated with, get the partitions, run the query, I'm refreshing my metadata view, and then I'm finally copying the data. So if I go ahead and run it, it's going to spin up. Refresh my activities. Wait. <laughs> so does the, the final complaint go back to the source and kind of mark it as a, like a confirmation that it was processed? Say that again with the data set? Uh, the restartability. So you got the metadata saying what you should process. At what point do you kind of go back and, and confirm that that was successfully processed? Yeah, so in my so in my pipeline here, the copy data sets, I have, I'm doing a few things. I'm uh, first, I'm saying if it's SQL, do this. Uh, I'm ingesting the data, which is the, the copy activity. Uh, I'm using the get metadata activity to get a couple neat uh, bits of information to, uh, such as uh, column count, uh, the item name, and then the size. So the size is the one that's most valuable to me. Um, and then I'm passing in those as parameters to a stored procedure and then just logging that as a, as a table. Does that answer that? So that, that and that's going to say like this individual partition. And that's going back to the specific source system and logging it there? No. Okay. The source system? Yeah, so if we were loading data from SQL, because the, the, the SQL source finds the metadata, right? Saying this is what. So there's two pieces. There, if you set up a table for partitioning, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit that, let's say about the first time you run this, it's going to hit that server twice before you actually copy the data. The first time to get the metadata. You don't have to run that every time. You could run it, uh, the get metadata pipeline, only when you know something's changed or something. Okay, um, so that's not keeping track of your watermarks or whatever. That's just purely metadata on tables and columns? That first pipeline is correct. Okay. The, the second piece, when in this particular pipeline, this activity here, this is the data loader. The other one I call it the schema loader. Um, this is the one that's going to say if I need to get partitions inside this loop, go and copy those partitions for that particular table on that particular server on that particular database, uh, and then stage it and, and, and merge it to. I have a staging table for watermarks, which it's not watermarks. It's really it's partitions. I hate that word. I don't like watermarks. Um, <laughs> driving me nuts. Um, so is that is that clear? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then, yeah. And there's all the functionality to like you know only go to that server if I need to. Avoid those additional connections unless you have to go and read a new uh, watermark value or, or whatever. Um. So this is running. Uh, I'm just gonna kill this. It's already copied a lot of data. Uh, if I go out to my data lake. Uh, you see it's stored uh, just based on different parameters. It's stored uh, my server name, which is my local machine, the different databases. Uh, so I have this one called Research, and I have all this Chicago crime data. Uh, and Chicago crime history is the one that I have set up for partitioning, and so everything is uh, has been split up by that year that we configured, and then the, the individual file just gets a timestamp. Uh, that's down to the second, so you don't accidentally re uh, overwrite it. Do you typically store in a like a flat file like that? Do you use any compressed types? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and you know, that's all configurable. So that would be like, um, you, you know, if, if the majority of the data in your data lake is going to be uh, compressed, then just add that as a uh, column on the options table and like is compressed. If you're using multiple compression types, you can create a list of compression types and associate those with different data sets. 
Um, yeah, I think I think you know when it comes to like adding on all these different options and stuff, keep it simple. Like if you don't have a use case for five different um, compression types, then uh, you know you, you don't need a whole new table for all those types. Considerations like that, small but important in my eyes. That pretty much wraps things up. Uh, future additions, I think I've mentioned all of these throughout the, thing, uh, the, the talk. Uh, new data factory source types as they come necessary. Um, file types, I will have, be having to add file types, but um, in, in the specific project that I'm on right now, just because of how they're, they're very weird file types, so I'll consider big data. Um, it might just be, end up being notebooks, but I'm going to figure out a way uh, for it to still be driven off this framework. Um, my goal is that this, this framework, you know, it's, 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 I've already accomplished that. It's become an enterprise solution for all their data factory ingestion. Um, so, yeah, it's been uh, really successful and uh, sharing it with you guys. Uh, build off of it, talk about it in six months. Tell me what you learned. And then, uh, I think uh, one of the cool pieces is adding on the streaming functionality. Uh, I think where I would, if you, in Databricks, you can use stream, structured streaming, which is Spark structured streaming, and I'm curious to see how that's going to tie into this, uh, if, it's, if it's necessary, or I would like to create a streaming pipeline that's completely dynamic, just like my relational pipeline, and then I can just simply say, okay, I, can, I want this streaming, this streaming, and it's going to partition this way. John, I'm curious, um, the techniques that you showed, um, have, have they been, have the source or the source, the target systems that you've been querying, have they been kind of custom data sources that a customer might have, or have they been like ERP sources like SAP or Oracle EBS or anything like that? They're all started relational. The data scientists want to augment their weird data sets with the relational first, and then okay. um, so that's always the first one that's being tackled. And you, you tackle files, uh, and then the last one or the current one that I'm on, uh, we couldn't ideally like we would have created like archive folders and then just like moved files to that archive after we processed it, but we couldn't. We didn't want to touch that other department. We wanted to keep. Uh, we didn't want to spend additional resources from different departments. We wanted to keep it extremely valuable. Um, so we had to write some other crazy process, and I think it's being done like Azure Batch Python. Something. Um, so again, it's use case. It's specific to uh, the use case that you're working with. Um, but as far as new data source types to this, I mean, I know I know it's very easy to add on files. Um, Have you done any like O data? So tapping into various like software as a service applications. Uh, not yet. No. Um, I haven't done a lot of that period. So, um, I mean, if you're pulling in batch data sets, um, there's a way to simplify it, probably. <laughs> I don't want to say for sure, but with this framework, just because of the, the abstraction of a data set. But you're no, you're no longer just you're ingesting tables or files, you're ingesting data sets. It's, inter it's a really interesting technique, but to be certain, there's complexities with these different kinds of other systems to be able to figure out, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, and that's where um, well, Data Factory comes in with all its fancy connections. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, one, one thing to note, empty data sets will create empty files. So if you don't want empty files in your data lake, and actually sometimes it's even cell in activity. Uh, I'm not sure the difference between why it succeeds sometimes and why it doesn't, but one thing to account. So you don't, um, another thing that you might want to add is, you know, don't copy that data unless there's actually data in it. Contact information, 
and that's the longest SQL talk I've given. <laughs> and gosh, any any other questions? Yeah. Uh, for are you talking about just like as a general practice or? Yeah. Um, yeah, more of a data scientist. I did, so um, I'll answer that based on a conversation I had with a friend of mine who works at Hortonworks. Um, his son went to apply at Microsoft, and they didn't care if he had Microsoft experience. They wanted an uh, open. Best answer I have. <laughs> Uh, I, I I just wrote PowerShell today, so and just realized they switched the Azure the PowerShell module two days after I finished actual work, so I was fixing it today. So there's like a the, the when you install the Azure RM module, they, it's now they're moving to a new one called like Azure AZ, and it's back down to version. But and it broke like it actually broke. Yeah. Do you see this? I, yeah, I started work with the AZ modules, and then you had to get rid of the others, but it wasn't supported in certain things. So yeah, it's a strange world that I, I locally I'm using AZ, but elsewhere I'm using the RMs, and yeah. Yeah, I, I was using it with the the CI/CD stuff. Um, anyway, yeah, I broke it. So I spent a, <laughs> spent a day trying to fix it, and all I had to do was switch the version. I was curious what you're doing, uh, maybe around like error handling and monitoring. Are you hooking it into Azure Monitor? Are you using, uh, you know, you can throw off HTTP events and other things. Are you are you doing something custom or just like Azure Monitor or or nothing? I've used Azure uh, Data Factory Analytics, um, which is log analytics, pretty much on top of the Data Factory uh, services. Um, that can that can give you. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential. It's a little complicated to get going. Um, but essentially, you just read events. Uh, but it has all the information, like everything that um, Data Factory is doing is being stored in log analytics. But I don't know. I think for if, it's not that hard to add on additional uh, logging tables and functionality to just understand, like with it, if you're just doing data ingestion, I, I really want to know how long data sets are taking if they pass and few other things like that. Um, but outside those two things, like, not really. Okay, so that is awesome. Yeah. yeah, I do like that. That's much better than, yeah, so I would say don't do the HTTP activities. I would say spin up log analytics so you can. That's what I'm doing, channel. the Azure Monitor, the alert, let me know if something yeah. fails. But Once it comes out preview. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And I could take this offline because it wasn't a part of your direct topic here, but you, you briefly alluded to early on the, 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 the promotion framework. process and um, you know the tying into Git. So uh, it has the publish and whether you're publishing, you know, either it's the ARM template a code or or. Uh, oh, I can walk through that with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll let everyone else go though because it's yeah. Usually these things last an hour. I apologize. <laughs> so yeah, that's all I had. Uh, no one else has any questions.